drug addiction, alcoholism, sadism, bestiality, mutilation, murder, vampirism, necrophilia, cannibalism, not to mention a gamut of sexual goodies. But shall I go on? You turn on the TV and you see a smiling, caring face there. Constantly there are ads for his wonderful rehab center. The glowing reviews and testimonials from former patients praise him for his care and for his caring attitude toward them. It's like an infomercial that runs constantly. You can't turn on your TV or go on YouTube without getting an ad for Sombra Rehab Center and its philanthropic owner Constantine Sinclair. What a load of horse shit. I looked into Sombra over the last few months and what I found out about them was not a single patient has ever truly checked out of Sombra. I have plenty of testimonials about people checking into Sombra, but I never discovered anyone who checked out. What I did find though digging into their dirt was a large number of death certificates made out from within Sombra. See, Sombra isn't just a rehab center. It also contains an in-house hospital and also mostly unknown to the general public, a morgue where plenty of bodies are processed, cremated, and their death certificates are written out. My name is Desmond Williams. I served several tours in Iraq before getting my degree in investigative journalism, and after busting several fraud companies all over New England, I set my sight on Sombra Rehab Center and their generous owner, Constantine Sinclair. At the start of my investigation, I was goddamn shocked to figure out that not a single person had ever checked out of Sombra, and that was enough for it to get my undivided attention, much to my editor Gracie's dismay. She doesn't get a say though, seeing as she has a conflict of interest, having donated to Sombra in the past. My best bet to find something fishy with Sombra was to follow the money trail. They had just had a big renovation after an unexplained fire broke out in the facility. I remember the first day of the fire, it was claimed that a patient had done this, but in the following days, no mention of the patient was ever made. Any time that I brought up this fact to the police officer that I was talking to, they would always claim that they either knew nothing about it or to talk to someone in higher command, so that lead was dead before it was even birthed. But that trail led further into the money trail. After all, you can't rebuild a place that big without a lot of money. Instead of purely looking into the rehab center itself, I also turned my attention towards the owner himself. Sinclair is everywhere promoting his rehab center. You can't see him at fundraisers, schools, nursing homes, and anywhere there is a social gathering, you can find him there. But one thing about him you won't find is any mention of how old he is or where he came from. On question to ask, but Plenty of us remember seeing Sinclair back in the 80s during the crack epidemic, looking exactly as he does now. Now, unless he's got a great fucking plastic surgeon, I don't buy the fact that he claims to be somewhere in his 40s or late 30s. Now, circling back to the money trail, where does he get his money from? Where does he get that much money to fund everything? Easy enough explanation to say is that He's a pretty boy rich kid, trust fund asshole. When I've checked his family history, there ain't no mention of a father or mother passing away and leaving him all their money. In fact, there isn't anything on him at all. No mention of him making business deals, nothing. Simply put, the man technically doesn't exist. So where does that money come from? Where does Sinclair come from? And where the fuck do the patients come in? So with far too many questions, I decided the only way to figure something out was to go undercover. I had to get myself admitted to Sombra. Grace was far from excited. The hell you are! She shouted at me when I told her I planned to go to Sombra and get myself checked in. I rolled my eyes knowing full well my mind was already made up. But Grace was hell-bent on giving me an earful on how bad the idea was. You aren't even an addict. You don't think that they're going to find out it's a little suspicious that you're checking in without being addicted to anything? She asked me, bringing up a fair point that I had already thought about beforehand. I'm going in for alcoholism, I told her. 
waving my metal flask around at her. You always said that I drink too much. Might as well get that work done, huh? I teased, taking one last good swig of my flask and tossing it at her. Here, a little memento to remember me when I get killed at Sombra. I half jokingly told her. No way in hell I'm letting your ass go to Sombra just to smear their good name. Grace huffed, tossing the flask back at me and hitting me in the back as I turned to continue packing. You ever think the reason that they don't have release forms is that they are confidential? You know, the whole doctor-patient confidentiality shit? She told me, stepping out in front and swiping away my car keys as I was just about to reach for them. Groaning, I went to reach for them, only for Grace to stretch out her arm out further from me. Grace, I need to do this. This shit just isn't adding up to me, I told her as I finally snatched my keys back from her. We stared at each other for a good long while before she sighed and nodded. We're both hot-headed and steadfast, never backing down from our opinions. It's what makes us such good partners, I think. I should really get around to putting that ring on her finger. She drove me to Sombra, and just laying eyes on the building gave me an uneasy feeling of dread as we pulled up to the entrance. Looking over at Grace, I nudged her shoulder with mine and gave her the most reassuring smile that I could muster, and that got a chuckle out of her. Shaking her head, she gave me a loving punch in the arm and sent me on my way. Walking up the steps to Sombra, I turned back and waved goodbye at her as I entered the rehab center. Can I help you? A soft voice asked me as I walked to the desk in the entrance lobby. Smiling at the woman at the front desk, I sat my very small carry-on bag down on the floor by my legs. I'd like to check in, please. It almost felt like I was checking into a hotel with how fancy and casual the whole place was. While it had a feeling of clean sanitation of a hospital, it also really felt like a fancy hotel or sauna. The nurse stared at me for a second before beaming and nodding quickly. Of course, sir. And might I add, I'm very proud of you for choosing to get some help. The nurse was so cheerful and excited that even though I wasn't really an addict, something about the way that she was excited for me genuinely made me happy and excited to start my regiment. Well, just a moment, I'll get the head nurse to check you in. She stood up quickly and walked over to the door behind her typing a code into the door and slipping into the back. I had already accounted for the fact that I wouldn't be allowed to keep my phone and other items. I had picked up a little pocket-sized recorder that I could keep in my palm during the times that I was searched for any items that might be considered contraband. I took the small item out of my bag and quickly slipped it into my pockets and proceeded to wait while the nurse went to go grab her boss. And soon enough, she came back through the door with a new nurse with her. Hello, sir. Might I have your name and other basic information? And of course, your choice of narcotic. Once that's all done, I can book you a room and start your treatment right away. The new nurse was the one that radiated a strange aura to me. While the receptionist nurse was one who seemed excited and happy to see me, I couldn't even begin to understand what was going on in this nurse's head. Well, I started off thinking in my head to make sure I got all the details right. My name is Desmond Williams, I'm 36, and I'm still waiting to grow into my body. I laughed at my own dumb short joke and was a little invigorated when both nurses joined in. I, uh, served in the army, a couple of tours in Iraq, started abusing alcohol once I got back, which wasn't necessarily wrong. Coming back from Iraq had been extremely difficult, and while alcohol helped with the PTSD sometimes when it got really bad, I was never one to abuse it in any way. You poor thing, the head nurse said, said with sincerity. The other nurse nodded with her. She smiled back at me and offered her hand to me. Where are my manners? I'm Nurse Emily, head nurse and the one who will usually be handing out your treatments. I nodded at her introduction. She definitely looked like she would be named Emily. I've got you booked in room 908, the receptionist nurse spoke up, pulling my attention over to her and nodding. I didn't exactly know if this was good or bad, so I just decided to go with it. Picking up my bag and turning my recorder on in my pocket, I followed after Nurse Emily as she led me away to my new accommodations. 
Finally, after arriving at room 908 after what seemed like an eternity, I stepped inside and took stock of my new living quarters. It was simple. A twin-size bed, a dresser, a side table, and a chair and table for sitting and doing work or whatever it was that you do in rehab. I also had a window with bars on it, which gave me my first warning sign. I hadn't noticed any room with them when we were driving over to Sombra. Turning my head to Emily, she followed my gaze and offered me a wave and a chuckle. Oh, that's just a simple precaution, Mr. Williams. Withdrawal symptoms will make you do some wild things sometimes. Walking over to the window, she showed me that I was still able to open the window and enjoy the nice fresh air. Nodding at that, I went about unpacking. But Emily walked over to me and looked over as I did, making sure you didn't sneak in anything illegal. You wouldn't believe what people try to sneak into here. Oh yeah? What's the craziest thing you've ever seen? I asked her, making small talk and also hoping that she would spill the beans on the cause of the fire that had consumed a portion of the building. She tapped her chin and thought in, in an almost exaggerated manner before making herself giggle with her memory. <laughs> um, one time someone snuck in a dildo. She said, getting a genuine snort out of me to hear her say dildo so nonchalantly. We shared a laugh at that and I went about unpacking as she watched over me. I handed her my cell phone when she asked for it. She put it in a Ziploc bag and wrote my name on it. So, um, I heard that there was a fire here last year, I said as smoothly as I could. She looked over at me with a quizzical look before nodding. Yeah, it was a, a whole mess. My predecessor was so badly burned she died in the hospital a couple of days later. She shook her head and sighed. Never did find the cause of it, I'm afraid. I nodded at that, but in my head, I was letting out an annoying groan. This was going to be hard to get to the bottom of. Yep, have any theories? I heard it was a patient here. I was hoping that she wouldn't get suspicious of my insistent questions. It looked like she was when I brought that up, but she simply shrugged and handed me some hospital clothes and socks from a nurse who arrived with a card full of them. I heard that, yes. Also heard it was bad wiring arsonists and lighting. Really, every cause in the book. She handed me a couple more clothes and I traded in my own for them. She handed them off to the other nurse before grabbing a checklist and starting to scribble on it. Now, when was the last time that you had a drink, Mr. Williams? She asked me. Um, about an hour ago. Wanted one last swig, you know? I told her. She nodded in understanding and quickly scribbled something down on her list. Will that cause any issues? I asked her, expecting to get dressed down for doing so, but instead she shook her head and offered me a smile. It just means that your detox will take longer. I'll be prescribing you pills to aid you in the process just in case it becomes, you know, too much for you to handle. She scribbled some more things down on her clipboard and handed it over to the cart nurse who nodded and pushed the cart along down the hallway. Great, um, anything else? I asked as I took my shirt off and started to put on my rehab issued clothes. She seemed to think for a moment before shaking her head with a smile. That should be everything, for now. Just get some rest and enjoy your stay. You're free to walk around and meet your fellow patients. Mr. Sinclair will also be around later today if you'd like to meet him. He has a special soft spot for fellow veterans. She said with a wave, leaving just before I could ask her one last question. Sitting in my new bed, I turned off the recorder and stripped down to my boxers as I switched pants. Fellow veteran, huh? Nothing in my research ever said that Sinclair was a veteran. Taking out a notebook and using the pen I had kept from signing into the center, I quickly scribbled down a few notes that I did have so far, mainly Sinclair and the fact that I hadn't even been given a drug test yet to see if I was on anything else. Finishing up with that, I stood up and left my room to go explore my new living space. The hallways continued with their strange blend of both hospital and hotel rooms. Not to mention the whole place was built like a giant maze with plenty of rooms to hold patients. And I'm not ashamed to admit that I got lost a bunch of times. Only really finding my way thanks to signs and to maps conveniently placed on the walls. I arrived at the recreation center to see that several other patients were there. 
They all appeared to be out of it. Some of them just stood around and stumbled around in a daze. It seemed like they were all hooked on heroin or something. Walking over to one patient who was trying and failing to put a puzzle together, I waved my hand in front of his eyes and got no sort of response from him. He was in a trance and seemed to be functioning on only muscle memory. Hey, quit bugging him! came a female voice from behind me. Turning to see that I saw that it was an only nurse that was behind me. Her arms were crossed and she looked like she was already fed up with whatever it was that had already happened to her again. I held my hands up and stepped away from the comatose man. You must be new, considering you're still conscious enough to understand me. Yeah, um, I just arrived this morning. I told her, and to which she looked at me like I had my hand caught in the cookie jar or something. Is there some kind of problem, ma'am? I asked her, and she looked back at me with hellfire in her eyes. I've never seen a white woman that angry, except if her name was Karen. Yeah, I have a problem. You should have never came here. This place is fucking cursed, and you just signed your own death warrant. She hissed at me, giving her voice down and quickly walking away from me with the quickest fast walk I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Left completely confused, I was wondering if she was just being ageist or had something more hiding beneath the surface. I followed after her as she left the rec room. Wait, hold up! I whisper shouted at her, grabbing her by the arm and getting a smack across the face from her for doing it. Ugh, okay, sorry, I, I deserve that. Look, I'm a journalist, I told her, looking around and pulling out my recorder. Her brow raised and she quickly looked around the hallway before yanking me into a nearby room. Are you for real? She asked me, and I nodded and told her my name. She pulled out her phone and did a quick google of my name and sure enough, my story was confirmed. She looked me over before sighing hard and noticing that the room was occupied by another patient. Lucky for both of us, we also seemed out of it. Fine, Mr. Williams. Uh, Desmond is fine. I told her to which she waved her hand at me and looked at the patient again, pulling me in close and whispering into my ear and the recorder I still had in my hand. Sinclair turns the people here into cattle for him. He then feeds them to his demon that pretends to be his shadow or is his shadow, she told me. I stared at her and seriously wondered if she belonged here as a patient instead of a nurse. Again though, she pulled out her phone and pulled up a video on her phone. The video showed a wheelchair-bound patient being wheeled before a man in a suit and an umbrella. Anyone who had seen Sinclair knows that he carries an umbrella everywhere he goes and uses it outside constantly. So, in my mind, it was obvious that it was Sinclair. It was clear to me that the nurse was filming from behind a corner as the events transpired. This one is primed and ready for you, sir. The familiar friendly voice of Nurse Emily came from the speakers of this nurse's phone. Sinclair nodded with his back to the camera before turning to examine the patient in the wheelchair. It was proven now to be him with his golden blonde hair and his hazel eyes. Thank you, Emily. You're free to go. He waved her off, getting a lovely bow from Emily as she walked away from the pair. Sinclair looked down at the patient before turning to his side and waving away something that apparently only he could see. Suddenly, the patient was lifted up from the wheelchair like it was nothing, before suddenly a large chunk of his face disappeared in a loud crunch sound. Sinclair stepped away from the gory affair as more and more pieces of the patient vanished. You can't see it in the video, the nurse told me as the video suddenly cut off and the last few pieces of the patient were seemingly chewed and swallowed away. But in person? You can see it plain as day. She quickly turned her phone off and shoved it into her pocket. A fucking shadow that's always around him. And he does that to his patients. She spat, looking at me and waiting for me to respond. Jesus. Was all I could muster. What I had just seen looked like a horror movie and I had just seen a live recording of it. That's why no one ever checks out here. I mumbled and the nurse quickly nodded. It's in your best interest not to take the medication that Nurse Emily will give you. They just turn you into one of those laughless husks. She told me, looking around before grabbing my palm and writing something down on it. 
If you manage to get out of here, contact me. I have a shit ton of more things to tell you. With that, she clicked her pen closed, shoved it into her pocket, and walked away from me. Completely caught off guard, I looked down at my palm to see the girl's email address and her name. Riley. I made a mental note of that and quickly clicked my recorder off and headed towards my room. But before I could get there, I was intercepted by Nurse Emily. Oh, just the man I was looking for, she said with a smile, holding up a bottle of pills and some water in one of those cone-shaped cups. You won't mind if I watch you, right? Just gotta make sure you're actually taking them. She chuckled and I nodded with a smile, secretly wanting to strangle her right then and there. Not a problem, I said, taking some pills in my hand and throwing them back. I had no intention of actually swallowing them. I held them under my tongue and took some water with them. With some difficulty moving them around my mouth, I managed to hide them under my tongue, showing them off to her and getting a thumbs up from her. Wonderful, no, oh, and I have some more good news. Mr. Sinclair would like to see you personally in his office. I gulped and nearly swallowed the pills, lifting up the cone cup to drink some more water and secretly spitting the pills back into it, crushing it before nodding to her. Sure. Take me to see him. Nurse Emily began to lead me into some unknown corridor of the rehab. She continued with her tasks as she led me towards some uncertain fate. Several things were running through my mind. The main thing being why the hell I had decided to go under my real name. Sort of hard being an undercover journalist when you use your actual name. The other thought was if Sinclair already knew who I was, then would I meet the same fate as the person I had just seen on the phone recording? And surprisingly, the thing worrying me the most was how I would react when I saw Constantine Sinclair. Whenever I saw his face on TV, I wanted to introduce my fist into his pretty rich boy face. Right this way, Mr. Williams, Emily told me as we came off the staff-only area of the rehab center. I watched as she used her ID and punched in a code before being able to enter the area. If I didn't know about what this place does to patients, this would have just been a precaution towards any patient that might cause a problem. But now I at least know a fraction of the truth about this place. Any number of things could be hidden behind that imposing metal door. I followed Emily in as the door opened up. As opposing as the oppressive sterile nature of the rehab center, the staff only room was almost like an airport member's lounge. You guys sure do live in luxury. I jabbed at Emily, thinking back to my plain sterile room and the overall sense of class division between the staff and the patients came more clear to me as I followed Emily further into the private area. The nurses had sleep stations that look something out of those rich people magazines or HGTV. Made me want to become a nurse and work here. Mr. Sinclair wants only the best for his staff and his patients as well, of course. Due to frequent vomiting and the like from patients, we have to keep our rooms quite simple for a comparison. I do apologize for that. I nodded and just kept following her as I looked around. This area was damaged mostly by the fire, so Mr. Sinclair made sure no expense was spared to rebuild it. Emily continued to sing Sinclair's praises, and I continued to absentmindedly nod along to whatever it was that she was saying. At long last, we arrived at an ornate door with the engravings CS on it. Knocking with the back of her hand, Emily stepped back and waited a few seconds before nodding to me and allowing me to step forward and open the door. The office, surprisingly, was much more simple than I thought it would be. It contained a few bookshelves, a wooden table surrounded by couches, and in the back middle of the room was a large wooden desk, where the blonde hair occupant was apparently intently writing something down. Take a seat, Mr. Williams. Sinclair didn't even bother looking up at me as he continued to write down whatever it was that he was saying. I simply walked over to the desk and took a seat at one of the available chairs in front of his desk. The owner of Sombra was puffing like a chimney on a cigar as he continued to write, occasionally taking the cigar out of his mouth and tapped it on an ashtray next to him. Finally, after maybe three minutes of awkward silence with me doing my best to not fidget and betray how nervous I was, Sinclair finally capped his fancy fountain pen and looked up at me. How do you do, Mr. Sinclair? I asked him, offering him a smile. 
my eyes drifted over to his shadow, which appeared just normal. It matched his head and hair, everything. What Riley said to have been true. It wasn't like she had just photoshopped him eating someone. He had to be prepared for everything. According to your file here, Sinclair said, ignoring my question completely. You're a veteran. Six tours of Iraq. He closed a manila folder next to him and looked at me with a quizzical expression. My guess was that he wanted a confirmation. That's right, sir. I nodded, puffing my chest out as my days in basic training came back all at once. Sergeant First Class Desmond Williams at your service. I even saluted him. My eyes still trained dead on him and his shadow. When Emily had mentioned that Sinclair was a veteran, I was damn sure that he was lying out of his ass. But something about seeing him here in front of me, and seeing the same look in his eyes, that was enough to tell me that he had seen some kind of service. At ease, Sergeant. Sinclair chuckled with a small smile on his face. We both aren't in the army anymore. He sighed and laid back in his chair, smoking on the last remains of a cigar as he looked back at me. How many days has it been since you slept without a nightmare? He asked me, getting a genuine sigh from me as I brought a hand up and rubbed my head. Uh, um, a long time, sir. Truthfully, I can't remember the last time I had a real good night's rest. Maybe it was the day before I was shipped out from my first tour of duty. Maybe it was the night of my high school graduation. But since then I haven't had a solid eight hours of sleep in a very long time. You know the pull of alcohol. After my tour of duty, I used it as a way to escape. As a way to avoid the impending feeling of death and of guilt for surviving when my men didn't. Sinclair's voice was hollow and I could tell how much pain he was carrying. His hand soon reached over to an ornate box and opened it. Cigar, Mr. Williams, he offered. Uh, no, no thank you sir. Not much of a smoker, I told him truthfully. That shit had always made my stomach sick and my nose and throat burn. But he nodded with understanding and proceeded to pick out one for himself. If you don't mind me asking, sir, at where'd you serve? I asked as he cut the end of his cigar off. It took him a moment, as if he was thinking about it before placing the cigar in his mouth and searching his pockets for what I assume was a lighter to light up his cigar. Afghanistan, he finally said after finding a box of matches in one of his pockets. Was pushing in on an enemy position when a mortar round took out my entire platoon. I got away without a scratch, though you can guess what that did to me mentally. He struck his match and held it up to his face for a moment. In that moment of him striking his match, I could have sworn that his shadow peered back at me with bright white eyes and white grinning mouth before it quickly returned to normal. Sinclair was unbothered by what seemed to be behind him and simply lit a cigar to life after a few puffs from it. He blew the smoke out onto his match and put it into the ashtray. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. I told him after giving him a few moments to enjoy his cigar. And me, a few moments to process what I believed to have been behind him. Is there a reason you wanted to see me? I wanted to know if he had any inclination of who I really was. Sinclair stared at me for a while, and this was before he blew out a puff of smoke toward me like he was some dragon ready to eat a defenseless meal. I make it a habit of meeting my fellow veterans, and making sure that they get the best of care here at Sombra, he told me with a smile. This one, however, I could tell immediately was fake, the same one he put on his TV commercials. I nodded back at the blonde dragon and stood since I assumed that our conversation was done. As I stood up, I noticed the portrait he had of himself right behind him, and that caught me off guard, mostly by the fact that it looked quite old. Notice my portrait, eh? He asked, looking behind himself and blowing a puff of smoke over to it. A little vanity project I wanted. He chuckled and looked back at me, standing up and walking over to show me out of his office. I understand that you've only just arrived. I look forward to seeing the progress you make, eh, Sergeant Williams? He patted me on the back and led me to his office door. The door opened and I turned to shake his hand. As I did so, I watched his shadow peeling itself off the wall and closed the door in my face. With that horrible act just done to me, 
I was primed to try and go back inside before a large burly hand grabbed my wrist. Before I could register who was grabbing at me, I was jabbed in the neck by a needle and lost all sensation in my legs. I got a good look at the ceiling as I collapsed to the floor on my back. Oh, and by the way, Sergeant Williams, Sinclair's voice appeared again, stepping out of his office and looking down at me. His shadow crawled across the ceiling and stared down at me with a wide gaping hole in its face that I assumed was a sort of mouth for whatever this creature was. If you plan on spying and exposing my establishment, you should really consider using a fake name. Sinclair shook his head at me and blew smoke towards my face. Soon I was lifted up and made to meet Sinclair face to face, his shadow crawling down the walls and took its position next to his blonde owner. Guessing I wasn't thinking straight, I spat out, wanting to spit on his face but finding it impossible to really do much but talk and move my eyes back and forth. Sinclair nodded and blew another puff of smoke into my face, causing me to cough uncontrollably. <coughs> you lying piece of shit. <laughs> you don't help people, you just use them like cattle. I hissed, wishing so badly that I could wrap my hands around his throat and squeeze the life out of him. As if anyone really cares about worthless junkies. Tell me something, son. He took another drag from his cigar as he started to walk around me and examine me like I was a nice cut of beef. And you start investigating me out of the goodness of your heart? Worry for the missing junkies? Or were you just chasing the mystery of who I am? He asked, returning to my field of vision and allowing some smoke to escape from his nose. Of course I care about addicts. I shouted at him, believing in my heart that I really was doing this for the addicts that he was killing. But the more I started to think of it, the more in my mind it began to make sense that it took more than just missing addicts to start this investigation. I'm sure you do. He mockingly told me, blowing more smoke at me and causing more coughs and sputters from me. <laughs> Take him to his room and make sure that he takes his meds correctly. I do not want another situation like the last time. Understand me? He pointed to someone outside of my limited cone of vision. Of course, Mr. Sinclair. Emily's voice called out, coming into the corner of my eye and turning to me in the orderlies who were holding me up. Soon I was manhandled into a wheelchair and cuffed to it quicker than a pit crew in a NASCAR could replace a tire. Sorry for the tight leashes, Desmond. We have precautions after the incident, so we really need to keep the troublesome ones from causing us too much trouble. Emily sighed, making sure my wrist restraints were so tight that I thought my hands were about to be cut off. Make sure my 2.30 appointment is on track. The new dealer out of Chicago has great promise to me, Sinclair told Nurse Emily as he turned around to enter his office. His shadow looked at me and offered a smile and various strange gurgling noises as it slithered back into the office after Sinclair. The door softly closed behind him. Okay, Mr. Williams, now how about we get you to bed and start you on your medication? Emily patted me on the head as the orderly started to wheel me out onto the staff-only area. A million things were going through my mind as I struggled to see how fast my whole plan had fallen apart, all from the stupid mistake of giving my real name. Grace, who was really going to give it to me if I ever could get out of here alive. The feeling in my body began to return just as we arrived in the room. I was untied from the wheelchair and manhandled into bed where I was tied to the bedpost by my wrists and ankles. Never was much for kinky shit, but even less in a place like this. You two can go now. We should be okay, Emily told the two orderlies. They nodded and walked out of the room, leaving the two of us alone. Nurse Emily reached into her pockets and pulled out a needle and a vial of some sort of clear fluid. You know, I only became head nurse very recently. My predecessor, Nurse Taylor. Oh, what a horrible woman. She shivered, walking over to me and tapping my arm to get my vein to appear. Seems you take after her. I jabbed at her, feeling betrayed by her, even though I should have expected this kind of loyalty from people willing to work for a Sinclair. Nurse Emily looked at me like I had just called her the C-word or something. 
I am not like her. She was a horrible bitch who was unnecessarily mean to our patients. Can you believe that? Finally finding a vein in my arm, she jabbed me with whatever was in there and pushed down on the plunger. I, for one, would much rather remain calm, cool, and courteous to our lovely patients. She pulled the needle out and dabbed me with a cotton swab and even a fucking band-aid on my arm. Somehow, I think that's even worse, I told her, which got only a shrug as a response. Whatever she had given me worked almost immediately. I became very drowsy as my eyelids weighed over a hundred pounds as I drifted off into sleep. But this was right before I saw Nurse Emily remove some more vials from her pockets 